This session is entitled, Who Decides the Public Good? The Role of Communities, Business and Government. Australia has been offered a once in a century opportunity to put itself on the world stage, but are the risks too high for the public to accept? This session will be uh, chaired by Mark Simkin, well, very well known chief political correspondent for the ABC News in Canberra. Uh, before his appointment to Canberra, Mark was based in Washington, District of Columbia, where he was responsible for reporting news from Chile to Canada, primarily for television. Washington was Mark's second overseas posting and he'd already spent four years as the ABC's North Asia correspondent based in Tokyo. In more than a decade with the ABC, Mark has been economics correspondent and political correspondent for the ABC Radio Current Affairs in Canberra and also political correspondent for national television and senior reporter for Late Line. I now introduce Mark to set the scene. Mark. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I'll do some introductions of my own, just to introduce the panel to you before we get underway. Uh, Lars Kluver needs no introduction. Uh, you've already heard from him, so I won't introduce Lars. Uh, but Associate Professor Andrew Bunnell is on the panel. Uh, he has written numerous books and articles specialising in modern German history. He's the past convener of the History Department at University of Queensland and is history editor of the Australian Journal of Politics and History. Uh, Dr John Curran is the general manager for communications at the CSIRO. Uh, he started out as a, uh, a researcher or a, a scientist uh, with research interests uh, and then moved into the field of communications with the CSIRO and uh, identifies a particular challenge in communicating uh, the unique issues facing a multidisciplinary research organisation like the CSIRO. He's held the position of General Manager of Communications since 2007. Senator Gary Humphreys is a Senator for the Australian Capital Territory. In 2003, he was chosen by the ACT Legislative Assembly to represent the ACT in the Senate. He was first elected to the ACT Legislative Assembly in 1989 at the inauguration of self-government. He spent most of his career in the Assembly, including uh, as a minister and chief minister. Dr Andrew Lee is the member for Fraser, which makes you're in your electorate now, I suppose. In fact, both Gary and Andrew are in their electorates. Uh, but prior to being elected as uh, a federal member in 2010, uh, Andrew was a professor of economics at the ANU. Uh, he holds a PhD in public policy from Harvard having graduated from University of Sydney with uh, a law degree and an arts degree. He's previously worked as a lawyer uh, and an advisor to the Australian Treasury. Associate Professor Michelle Simmons is from the University of South Australia. Uh, she's been working there since 1993 in a variety of roles, including research assistant, tutor and lecturer. She is currently the program director for the uh, Bachelor of Education. Uh, immediately prior to coming to the university, she worked in the community as a manager of a family relationships education program in a non-government welfare organisation. So they are our panellists. Uh, and that means we'll begin the hypothetical. It's a little bit unusual for me. Normally, when I ask questions of people, particularly people like Gary and Andrew, if there's even a hint of the hypothetical in us, I'm told I can't answer that question, it's hypothetical. <laughs> well, today is all about hypotheticals, and in fact, it is one big hypothetical. So welcome to 2020. Now, according to current predictions and plans by actual governments, in 2020, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia and India are now developed countries and economies. The Chinese space station has just started operation, India's space agency is in the, in the process of sending a manned space mission to the moon and they'll have a bit of company up there because Russia's space agency is meant to be mining helium-3 on the lunar surface. In Australia, well, there are now 25 million Australians with more 65-year-olds than one-year-olds. The mining boom is coming to a close and energy scarcity is the number one concern of politicians and the public alike. 
coal is close to finish, but wind and solar haven't met expectations. So there's talk that Australia may have to move into uh, and build a large-scale nuclear power station. The good news is that the push from 2012 onwards by Australia's chief scientists and the federal government to make Australia a leader in science, maths and technology is starting to bear fruit. This is particularly good news because in Europe the Large Hadron Collider is reaching the end of its useful life. This is a device that scientists used way, whoops, excuse me, what collider, see? That, that, was, that was deliberate. Uh, this was a device that scientists used way, way back in 2012 to find the Higgs boson or God particle. Now, the scientists at the time, back in 2012, got very excited about this. They thought this was you know, a massive scientific discovery, perhaps the discovery of the century. But it did leave members of the public and some cynics in the media scratching their heads. What is this God's particle actually for? What's it going to do? But now in 2020, it's time to build a new, improved and much bigger collider. The European Organisation for Nuclear Research, or CERN, can't find any more space under the Swiss Alps, uh, and there are serious geological problems there, so they've had to look further afield, much further afield, enter Australia. CERN approaches the Australian government with a very bold idea, to build a very, very big collider in Australia. Australia's got plenty of space, it's geologically stable, it's got an educated, science-friendly uh, workforce and population. As CERN put it, Australians are world class. The collider will be large, ten times bigger than the current collider in Switzerland. A collider this size, CERN argues, could have benefits we can't even imagine. But at the very least, it's a good chance to provide an answer to the energy crisis and global warming by finding a safe, unlimited source of energy. So let's open it up to the panel at that point. It all sounds like really good news. Can I ask Lars to start with? Lars, when science is very complicated, how do you even begin to weigh up the risks and the benefits? I would begin weighing it up by, by asking experts, but not those experts who have something at stake, not those who would be employed at this very, very, very big collider. I would ask, I would ask many experts from different fields of their view of this, so I would start there. And the reason is, uh, <coughs> coupled to the question we got before, how do you make good information about what all the issues are? So I will collect the issues. And I would do that by inviting experts. And that would be the beginning. And I, you will have a question later about and then, in, when, then later phases. Yeah. But that would be the beginning. We have to have an overview of the problem. Can I ask any of the other panellists to jump in? Uh, are there any precedents for this sort of thing in Australia? Are we any good at asking the right experts the right questions when faced with these sort of opportunities? I think we often like to think that we're uh, good at answering scientific questions ourselves, but the fact is that most of us know frighteningly little science. For example, if I were to ask you which was better to get rid of a headache, uh, taking two tablets derived from the bark of a willow tree, uh, or connecting an intravenous drip up to you to allow saline solution to go into, into you, I doubt most of us could explain the chemistry as to why aspirin beats an intravenous drip for getting rid of a headache. And if we can't even answer something on that, that, that scale, then we're dwarfed by most of science. So I think all of these scientific questions come down to using experts and the challenge for all of us and maybe even more for policymakers like Gary and me is how we use experts well and how we aggregate their collective wisdom. Can I ask John Curran, in a situation like this, John, how would you start to manage public expectations? Well, I think there's a, already in the introduction and in the scenario, and it was created by the scientists themselves, there's a lot of hype in it. So the God's particle is a recipe for challenge later on. Um, there's another way of describing it. It is yet another subatomic particle in a string of subatomic particles that happen to address a very important scientific theory, theory hypothesis. That's what it actually did. So there's a lot of hype that we generate about science 
which distracts from what difference does it actually make. And what difference this makes is understanding some deep issues in science, and that's pretty well it. Is this something that, and I'm not using the scientific term here, that often comes to, to bite people back on the bum because the hype is so big, understanding so limited, that the capacity to uh, fail to deliver or be perceived to have failed in some way is increased? Uh, absolutely, and I was there 25 years ago at the start of the genetic modification debate, so I experienced the bumps along the way where we overhyped it, we overplayed it, we didn't know what we could actually achieve, but we pushed too hard too early with very little engagement. Let's move on. Clearly you've actually done your homework and read the rest of the hypothetical because uh, it does sound too good to be true, but the government signs up, yes, 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 this is terrific. It's an opportunity for Australia and for the world. The pluses are potentially huge. We have a technology boom on our hands with 20,000 jobs created by the Collider construction and operations for many years to come. The economy will receive an enormous injection of foreign capital. There'll be an infrastructure boost, high profile collaboration with the biggest scientific experiment in the world. So the Prime Minister is saying the, the very large Collider uh, is going to put Australia at the centre of the, of the world stage on a global scientific discovery. So the Australian public is pretty excited as well. Uh, imagine this, the God particle in our own backyard. But of course then the question, exactly whose backyard will get the God particle? Where do you build the biggest machine on Earth? Well, a group of scientists are deployed to find a site and they settle on a site 300 kilometres northwest of Adelaide. It's Crown land and following consultations, the local Aboriginal community supports the project, provided jobs and local infrastructure are provided. A wonderful opportunity seems to be falling into place. But, there's always a but. Australia's most controversial journalist, Craig Tate, interviews Dr Isotope, a particle physicist from Luxembourg, in a late night interview. Craig asked if it's true the Higgs boson discovery will lead to time travel and the ability to beam me up like Star Trek. Dr Tope says, that's ridiculous. Craig then asks about an, a rumour going around the internet that the very large collider could create a black hole. Dr Tope scoffs again, saying, oh, no, no, that, that's very unlikely. Now, any journalist knows that's not a complete rule out and that creates a few problems. Craig presses Dr Tope for what very unlikely means. Dr Tope becomes annoyed because this is a stupid journalist who doesn't know what he's talking about, asking stupid questions, and says if a black hole was created, it would probably evaporate so quickly no one would notice. Well, how does the media deal with that? Responsibly, reasonably, <laughs> not on your life. The Australian public panics. By not lunchtime the next day, the interview has been viewed by a million Australians on YouTube, or whatever the equivalent in 2012 is, uh, worried that a black hole will be launched in the middle of our continent. Gary Humphreys, is that realistic? Is it realistic that irresponsible media, uh, alarmist lobby groups can create real panic with something that is actually unlikely to happen? Oh, well, absolutely, unfortunately. Um, uh, in an age when, uh, as Andrew pointed out, uh, a lot of people know a very little amount about lots of things, um, when someone hears about a plausible theory that, you know, we know black holes exist, we know that, uh, you know, they're very dangerous and, um, and this uh, great big technology uh, might just create one, well, it's unfortunately easily um, uh, converted into a public scare and uh, the challenge for policy makers and politicians is to decide as quickly as they can whether this sort of claim has any foundation or whether it is indeed um, a barrier to making a good policy decision on this particular issue. Could I ask the, the two politicians on the panel then, are we in a position in Australia where it's almost impossible to prosecute a complicated scientific case uh, when the media cycle is so sped up, when the capacity for uh, opposition or uh, criticism is so, uh, so easy to make? Well, I might say on that that um, I think it's very important in those circumstances that uh, we, we elevate the importance of good advice, that we don't let um, ourselves fall into the position of assuming that um, because we're elected members of parliament and we have responsibility for departments of state 
that we know what's going on best, uh, that uh, we are in a, the best possible position to make these decisions. I think uh, to a large extent um, we have in recent years created an expectation that expert bodies are able to give governments good advice and the public good advice. That knowledge is very democratically available. All these things are usually shared uh, over the internet so people can see and read these ev this evidence for themselves. And um, to the extent that politicians have invested in the, in the integrity of these organisations and, and use them as tools for making good policy at arm's length from government, then you've got a basis on which to conduct a debate in a somewhat more mature way. Andrew? Yes, I, I agree with very much of what Gary has said. In fact, um, uh, 13 years ago, back in, uh, if you can remember all the way back to 2012, I, I gave a lecture in this very room, uh, the first uh, Challenge Your Mind lecture, uh, which was arguing that the shifts in the Australian media landscape made uh, priv privileged sound bites, snappy one-liners and populism over good policy reform. Uh, for those reformers among us, it's a challenge to be able to prosecute those larger, those larger arguments and that's only become harder as the media cycles sped up to where we are in 2025 today. Andrew Bunnell, what role does science have to correct misconceptions? You know, how incumbent should it be on the scientific community to stand up there when a debate starts ravelling out of control, when uh, inaccurate information is, is the currency of the day and actually say, hey, hold on, hold your horses? Well, I think they have to play their part in uh making their professional expertise accessible to the wider public, although uh, you know, to do that they actually need to have access to, uh, to media and get, uh, get, get space in, uh, in op-ed pages and, uh, and airtime. Uh, so sometimes uh, scholars and specialists do have useful things to say, but they, they can't, get the, can't get the media space to, to do that. Uh, and they've also got to compete with the sort of white noise that's coming from, you know, the, the political debate and, uh, and, 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 you know, internet uh, uh, speculation and so on. So, uh, yes, there is a clear professional responsibility, but it's sometimes hard for uh, academics to uh, find, the, find the avenues to get that out there. I think you've just described John Curran's job. Uh, <laughs> John, are scientists in Australia vocal enough? Uh, I'm thinking carbon tax debate being a particular example. We heard a lot from uh, pretty extreme elements in that debate, but did we hear enough from scientists? Um, I'd respond uh, in a very careful way on that one, <laughs> uh, in the sense that uh, what people forget, and Lars touched on it, on, on the major challenges that we face, there's actually bipartisan support. We need to do something about carbon, we need to do something about water. We need to do things about fishery quotas, all those current topics that have been in the media. And we've got to separate, as scientists and the community, that day-to-day -day politic and point scoring, which is a little bit part of democracy. So, in fact, there's a great uh, desire from some scientists to actually jump out there and shout very loudly at a time when calm, persistent, constant messaging of the system is much more appropriate. So we often deal with people getting very upset about a particular issue. It's hit the media, it's being distorted, and they want to write an open letter. And we say to them, that's the most biggest waste of time you'll do. Any open letter is a political statement. You place yourself in a position where it's going to get hard to come back from if you are truly providing independent, non-partisan advice. Go back to the basis of communicating science. Enough I could hog the reply for a moment. The issue of uh, climate science. Now, whenever we put out with the Bureau of Meteorology the, an update on the climate science as we understand it, the facts as we know them and present them to the Australian public, huge coverage in the media, very positive response from the community at large. But it brings out a certain section of the community very aggressively, and they start attacking us. And again, the challenge there is to respond calmly and politely, which we do. But there's a very interesting thing that happened just recently to me where I tend to feel the, the very aggressive ones to protect the scientists. And this guy was absolutely persistent. And every time I'd point back to where the publicly available information about that particular fact that he's challenging me, this went on and on and on. Every day there was another one. And in the end, somewhat frustrated, but still polite, I sent him, I asked him, would you like the book on climate change? And he said yes. And I sent him the book, and if I'd had some wood, I'd touch it. Since then, he hasn't bothered to contact me. <laughs> so there's, I've got two interpretations. Dennis Jensen, No, there's two interpretations of this. One is, 
that in fact he's plowing through it about to Don Marden with the big question, <laughs> or two, which is the one I prefer, is actually it was a fault of us in terms of communicating science. We keep putting out pieces of the story, pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, without painting the whole picture. The stuff that's in the climate change book has to tell a story from A to Z. It's a narrative about why we believe that, and interpret the data in the way that we do. Okay? And I think that's something that we forget, is the storytelling, the context, when we too heavily rely on a specific fact. Lars, is this something that is a similar dynamic in Europe, or is Australia unique in this regard? Uh, again, you might want to use climate change to inform that response, or, uh, or the, the scenario uh, in the hypothetical. I think, I think it's global, and I think, I think the, the things that John say, they are the global uh, discussion and, and the global problem. I mean, scientists uh, should involve, but they often involve with a specific stand, and then another one comes, says another thing, and another one comes, says another thing, so it's like a, a very bad, bad dart player hitting everything else but the, the, the dart thing. It's a, and everybody can see that. They're, they're positioned there, 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 but what is the whole picture? And I think it's very important that it's not scientists who individually go out, position themselves, because they find it fun as well to be in the media and, and they profile their institute and things like that, so, but that someone takes the responsibility to gather the whole picture and communicate that. I think that's extremely important and it's not done very often. Michelle Simons, you're our South Australian representative. This, is, this collider has been built in your backyard, but you're also an expert on education and training. Can you give us an idea of the, the workforce and skill supply issues that work in Australia and whether a state like South Australia could cope with a project of, of this size? Well, of course we could, but um, <laughs> uh, one of the things I think is to, to think about the reaction of the people who live 300 kilometres north-west of Adelaide where this might be located. I don't know whether you know South Australia at all, but a lot of these are, it, it's going to be around little, little communities like Lock, um, has 300 people in it, um, is, a, is a farming community, um, um, wheat and sheep. And, and, uh, and like a lot of regional areas, has over the last 30 or 40 years been extremely depleted. <clears throat> and so while all the scientists are debating, um, the local shopkeeper in Locke is wondering what on earth is going to happen to his business. And the, the schools and um, all of the other services that have are often become so depleted or difficult in those areas are starting to, to not so worry much about the science or whether they're going to have the God particle, but, but what does it mean for me? And I think um, we have developed our capacity to, to train people for large-scale projects, although to some degree that's been diminished a lot because often we think of the scientists and the mathematicians that are needed and they are well catered for by a world-class university system, but um, the public provision of particularly vocational education and training has been wound back and wound back very, very a lot. And we're now in a situation where a lot of that paraprofessional and technical expertise that we need to support the scientists is very hard to come by. And I think... Um, that that is becoming an issue. A lot of uh, private providers have tried to step into the breach, but a lot of these um, sorts of education are very expensive to provide. The other thing that also is a real tension and push in this is that South Australia is also the festival state. We're known for our tourism and our wine and our arts. And a lot of people are also concerned that putting all our eggs in one basket is going to be um, not useful to, for example, say that you know, we need to train our young people only because this great white hope is coming. Also not, not going to be a useful way to go, particularly when there's so much invested in these other parts that enrich and make South Australia such a wonderful <coughs> place to live. So a lot, of the, a lot of the local concerns are saying, well, yes, of course we can do it, but um, think about the people who are going to, you know, in the little town of Locke with its 200 and... 90 people and you know is, is what's going to happen is that going to be shifted lock stock and barrow or what's going to be happen to the wilderness areas um, some of you may not know but in 2004 there were wilderness areas in Hambidge and, and Hinks that were declared they were one of the first wilderness areas in mainland Australia now we don't exactly know politicians aren't good at telling us details 
Um, you know, are those areas going to be impacted on? Probably they are. And so, of course, with our very strong green credentials, we're also wondering what's going to happen. So, Well, let me put some of that to Gary uh, first of all. How do you balance, as a politician, the, the needs of a local constituency and the broader public interest? And is it an easy thing to do or is it one that involves constant compromise and, and uh, juggling? Well, the, the reality, Mark, is that these are always issues in considerable tension. Um, you want to make the best possible decision, but you also want to be re-elected. Um, so you'll, you know, you'll look at the potential for a decision in a particular place to influence you know, votes in marginal seats. You'll think about you know, how a particular issue might sort of change the image of your, your government uh, uh, in respect of a particular public debate. Um, I'd love to think that we always made the decisions based on the best possible scientific and, and empirical evidence, <clears throat> but the reality is that politicians react to political climates. They're elected by, by people who themselves have you know, um, uh, pre prejudices about things or, or make assumptions about things, and you play to those things when you make decisions to some extent. Andrew, have you ever had to make a, a decision in a policy sense uh, that might have been in the national interest but you knew would be against the interests of your local constituents? I can't immediately think of one, Mark, but I, I mean, unlike Gary, I've only been in public life two years. Uh, what strikes me, though, about this scenario is that there's so many elements of the mining boom challenge, which is what happens to the jobs base of South Australia if you bring in a very highly capital intensive industry, which is the large, uh, the very large Hadron Collider. Uh, and you know, that's one of these challenges that Australia will constantly face. We're going to have technology creating new industries. Those new industries require workers from existing industries and that'll generate structural change as workers m flow from one industry to another. Uh, one, uh, one of my favourite economic historians talks about the story of economic growth as being running across ice flows, which is not a very reassuring metaphor, but I think is broadly accurate for the change that we've seen the world go through from agriculture to manufacturing to services, uh, and then with these sort of technological booms. But there is this one really interesting thing about this too, which is that it, it highlights how bad we can be sometimes in assessing risks. So the very large Hadron Collider, as, as Mark said before, has a very small probability of generating a black hole, which we think with reasonable certainty will go away. But of course, it, if it doesn't, then we all cease to exist. Um, there's a new centre at Oxford devoted to what's called existential risks the risks that could wipe us all out. Um, and they argue that we're spending much too little energy on existential risks. Think of nuclear war, think of meteors hitting the earth. The Stern Review on climate change estimated that every year we face a 0.1% probability of existential risk. One in a thousand chance that every one of us could be wiped out, plus all our kids, plus all their successes. If that's really true, we're massively under-investing in, in stopping meteors striking the earth, stopping nuclear war, and maybe we shouldn't be going ahead with something that could generate a black hole. You mentioned the, the mining comparison and that you've also done your homework because that's the perfect segue into the next part of this process. Uh, an independent think tank, the Furphy Institute, publishes its projections on the impact of the Very Large Hadron Collider on the Australian economy. The Institute predicts that Australia's high-tech and science industries will be stripped bare, stripped bare of staff in order to meet the project's requirements. It also highlights that at least 5,000 foreign scientists, engineers and technicians will be imported to meet staff requirements. Sound familiar? It's Gina Reinhart would certainly recognise that. What impact will there be on the Australian economy? How do we know these scientists will leave? Will they be permanent? None of these questions have been factored into the federal government's decision. Andrew Bonnell, with your hat on as head of the NTEU, what is the point of educating Australians to a, 
a high level of scientific ability, technical ability, when they're going to go off and work for a foreign consortium rather than for Australian industry and business? Well, I think one of the issues that you know, has emerged by 2020 is uh, you know, the extent to which we've been sucking uh, skilled research labour out of our region by uh, in bringing in thousands of uh, uh, international uh, research higher degree students uh, to work in the form of sort of indentured labour as, uh, as, as PhD students in big research institutes uh, uh, where we, we pay them the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Australian Postgraduate Award stipend, and so that makes them quite cheap to, to employ as full-time research workers, and then they get the PhD credential after three years. So by 2020, I think the issue is not that there's a, a, a shortage of uh, skilled uh, scientific and research workers in Australia, uh, and, and whether the uh, facility they work on is run by an international consortium or not is kind of uh, a secondary issue. Uh, I think one of the emerging issues by then will be the impact we're having on the uh, sort of research training uh, workforce in, in our region by the fact that we've been uh, 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 running a sort of migration indentured labour scheme. Uh, the uh, research higher degree students in big science institutes are quite different uh, from the ones that we have in the humanities where we have students working on projects driven by their in individual curiosity and we nurture them and, uh, and, uh, and uh, as, you know, as individuals. Uh, often RHD students working in uh, big research institutes do, these see them, do see themselves as cheap research labour working on one, one thirtieth of the professor's big project. And uh, so I think, if, I think that's more of an issue as to whether we're creating imbalances in the... Uh, uh, workforce uh, in, in our region by, by bringing in uh, such large numbers of people and then treating them as cheap labour. Uh, and by 2020, they're getting increased, these uh, international postgraduates are getting increasingly well organised and militant. Mich Michelle, did you want to uh, pick up on that? <coughs> Again, I think the scientists um, and uh, the engineers and people are only the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot of other people that are going to, if this is going to go ahead, are going to be needed. And it's not just going to be um, the technical and support staff that I talked about that are going to be difficult to find. It's also going to be the people that are going to have to work in the communities to provide those services. Um, to be able to build up, a, again, a tiny little town like Lock or any of those other little local communities to a stage where they can actually have the capacity to be able to deal with all of the social demands um, you only have to look at what happened to Darwin 20 years ago when the, the um, Defence Forces moved up there and some of the social impacts that happened there. It doesn't matter whether the, where, what the influx is. There's a huge alteration to the, the whole social fabric. And so it's not just about focusing on whether we've got enough scientists. It's also focusing about on all the other services that people like though, that are going to expect uh, if they're going to be living on or around. Um, I don't know that we'll be at the stage where we can expect people to commute 300 kilometres um, every day to go to work or whether we will have some of them remotely located. But some of them are going to have to be, um, be local and we also have, are still wrestling with the issue of fly-in and fly-out workers and the damage that they do to communities as well. So there's a whole lot of social questions that have to be asked and services that have to be wrapped around that. So the education and training is not just about the scientists. This project has uh, promised to uh, provide Indigenous and local community training and investment and, and jobs. Uh, Michelle, are there examples of where that has worked well and, and what are the challenges uh, of making those promises and actua actually delivering on them? Well, I think um, the, some, it depends who you look at. Some people would say there's been some successes in the mining industry and engaging Indigenous communities. Um, others would look at the and that and say, well, no, they haven't because there's still parts of those communities that have been disenfranchised. I think one of the things that often happens, though, in the excitement of getting up something like this, the time is not taken to do the consultation that's needed working particularly with Indigenous communities takes an enormous amount of time and effort and, um, 
and we don't, I think, have overall a really good track record of being able to build the sorts of um, structures and, and organisations that truly are inclusive and accommodating. We're always in this situation of trying to, I guess, insert people into a particular system to gain a particular end. And so I think, um, you know, whether people have the patience with the time uh, to, to actually genuinely engage with um, particularly our Indigenous um, colleagues to, to be able to really understand what it would mean and what, what could possibly be done. There are some examples, but my experience would say that those, those, the track record is not good in that area. Can I add in something here too? And I think it's, uh, w we need to communicate how science will be done in the future and already is done. It is a global business. Uh, if you think of major infrastructure already in Australia, like the parks, telescope, etc., that's controlled remotely from around the world. People don't need to be here, so there's the danger of overplaying how many jobs will be on the ground. Uh, there are engineers that need to maintain equipment, but most of the major facilities are actually run remotely. Um, things like the our own synchrotron in um, that's based in a suburb of Melbourne. Right? It is a beam line, a smaller beam line than the collider. It's an electron beam line, not a proton beam line but it is still a beam line. Uh, we, ANSTO uh, at Lucas Heights has a nuclear reactor right in suburban Sydney. Um, so people need to understand that there's a context that we've actually operate these things already. The square kilometre array is in Western Australia, will be built in Western Australia. That will be a huge investment, but not many people. So construction phase, yes, many jobs. After that, very few jobs will be on the ground. Western Australia. So we need to, again, it's this overhyping of things. And but while I remember it, and this yeah. issue about, because the issue of black holes and how much energy, mm. on the Collider website, it's a wonderful little fact, the total energy in the beam line going full bore is equivalent to a Subaru being driven at 1,700 kilometres an hour. So there's a reference <laughs> point for you. But doesn't that raise the issue of, you know, yes, we can inject people in in, this, in the construction phase and then everybody leaves? You know, it, it's an issue of itself. Yeah, yeah it is. It, you know, the sustainability of these communities, um, you know, when they're already decimated, uh, and and saying, you know, we can, it's almost, you know, like, um, you know, we, it's not even, it's not even an inoculation. It's actually worse than that. Um, you know, the, and and what, what havoc that could create socially as well as environmentally and other things. Can I just pick up on the, the point John raised and ask anyone on the panel who may wish to answer this? I mean, who's to blame then for the fact that uh, it's not generally appreciated that scientific uh, projects can coexist quite happily in someone's backyard? Uh, if we were talking about building a nuclear reactor, uh, you know uh, either the politicians, the media or interest groups would be screaming in whose backyard is this going to be? And the debate suddenly gets sidetracked well away from the need for this and whether it's the right technology for Australia. Is, it a, is everyone collectively responsible or are there some particular culprits uh, who should be called out, singled out and sought out? Uh, does anyone on the panel want to touch that? I, mean, yeah. I just wanted to pick up a, what I thought was a terrific point that Gary was making earlier about the tension between policy and politics. And you just you face this all the time as a politician that sense that you know, I can either slap down my opponent with a terrific one-liner uh, and score a, score a point, or I can actually say something long-term and constructive. And when the, the more people are doing, following the first strategy, the more difficult it is to pursue the second strategy. Uh, but that's the one you've got to pursue if you're going to bring in scientists, if you're going to foster long-term research, if you're going to speak honestly with people about when risks are large and small. If I could um, answer your question by saying <coughs> I think we, we, we collectively bear some responsibility for um, you know, the, the failure to have a bit more educated debate. We, we need to encourage a, you know, a, a culture of respect for, for knowledge and science. Um, and we all individually like to invest a little bit from time to time in that culture, but we also like to withdraw when, when, uh, when it's convenient to do so. Um, so, you know, as politicians, you know, I like to think that we talk up our 
great national research institutions. Um, I mean, as Ken Berens, Andrew and I certainly do that, because lots of them are based here, and we, we're very parochial about that, you know, but uh, we feel it's important to, to talk that kind of process up. Um, the, the media bears some responsibility for being happy to jump on a on an issue which sort of which has a bit of a, a bit of tang to it uh, that sort of that can have a sort of anti-scientific flavour about it, um, and I think have to be have to say I think also social media, in particular, represents a threat to this. Um, I would argue that um, the decision last week um, by the federal government to cancel uh, the M V McGuiris um, uh, project uh, was a response to a social media campaign that went against the very best. Uh, available scientific evidence from Australia's world-class um, uh, um, uh, fishing um, research institutions about what was appropriate and, and good for Australia's fishing industry. But again, you know, we haven't got an investment in maintaining the integrity and respecting the value of that, that sort of ad advice. Uh, and when, when it's challenged and when politics intrudes, well, it sort of gets swept to one side. Lars, you wanted to say something? I think, in, I think definitely this is a political uh, responsibility to take a decision of that, but they will have a hard time because the whole thing started with the too simple model. It started with science will, will be, if we invest in this and this science, we'll get those and those promises, hope and hype, and it ends up with that the rest of society begins to exp find out that there are local issues, there are risk issues, there are all different kinds, so all this pops up later. And then, so, so the whole thing started as a very simple, scientific, hope thing, and it ends up with the complicated model. So, they, so why I say that you have a, a, a difficult time is, they will have to go back. They will have to use the time out in order to be able to take that decision in a legitimate way. So definitely the politician's responsibility, but they will have to, they will have to begin all over. Well, there is one more complication before any time out, and the South Australian Premier holds a press conference. His staff have just been advised that the collider will require extremely high voltages for its experiments, and this will stress an already overtaxed South Australian power grid. Is South Australia prepared for the brownouts threatened which, uh, when each collision takes place? The citizens of Adelaide are furious, uh, the press is going mad, business is saying, hey, this is crazy. The project has the potential to suck the life out of not only research and development, but manufacturing, construction and mining as well. Activist, group be, uh, activist groups begin to question other potential consequences. Uh, what, they, what they're calling the titanic subterranean magno donut particle smasher in Europe has already had a number of serious quenches uh, by making a particle smasher ten times bigger, are we looking at an event on par with a nuclear meltdown? Talkback radio is on overdrive. The public uh, is anxious and the Prime Minister senses it, so the Prime Minister holds another press conference. Yes, there are many questions about the collider, the Prime Minister says, but the Australian public needs to understand that the science involved is, is not just important, but very, very complex. Far more complex than an ordinary citizen could be expected to understand. But the Prime Minister has taken the advice of top scientists from Australia and around the world and is more than satisfied that none of these risks carry any real weight. But the, on the other side of the world, the, the head of CERN is doorstopped in Geneva and he shakes his head and says, I thought Australians were better educated. In Europe, we never have such problems. So it seems like the very large collider has had a very large collision with public opinion and perceptions of, of the public interest. The title of this session is Who Decides the Public Good? Could I ask the panel, and whoever wants to take it, who does decide the public good? And perhaps a supplementary, who should decide the public good? Don't fall so over yourselves. <laughs> so all of us play a role in determining the public good as citizens it's our job to make sure that we leave the place a little bit better than when we first came into it. It's our job to leave a better Australia than uh, for our kids. We as politicians play a role, but, but uh, community activists, media, academics all have vital roles to play. And if I'd leave you with one thing, it would be this. 
I think the changing media technologies have privileged populism, snappy one-liners, quick snap-downs. And I think they've particularly hurt thoughtfulness and doubt. If you actually believe in evidence-based policymaking, you must believe that the evidence could change your mind. But changing your mind in politics is incredibly difficult. We need, in some sense, a system that helps subsidise people who are doubtful, reflective, even admit a mistake, uh, because the only way of getting to the right answer is to have more encouragement for those who admit that they've had wrong answers in the past. Of course, the media would uh, label a change of mind a terrible backflip. A backflip is a worse thing than the right decision. Could I ask uh, both Andrew and Lars, perhaps, is there a difference in, in world view uh, between a European view, the uh, way a European uh, community would handle this, and an Australian perspective? Well, if I, if I could respond to the, the previous question first, uh, I, think, I think Lars is better equipped to speak to the European example, but uh, uh, I mean, clearly deciding the public good has to be a you know, the result of democratic decision-making processes and, uh, and uh, public discussions with, in which, you know, hopefully large uh, sections of the population take part. But uh, I think there's a special role for education in a couple of ways here. And one is you're going to get a better quality of, dis of public discussion the higher the participation rate you've got in higher education, uh, and our uh, participation rate uh, is, is well behind that of countries like Germany and, I believe, Denmark. Uh, so, you know, when people ask what's the economic value of investing in, you know, arts degrees, for example, and uh, then, you know, having a more educated uh, citizenry so that they can take part in more active citizenship and more active public debates is actually uh, the long-term payoff of uh, much larger higher education participation, which, you know, happily has been, you know, growing somewhat in, uh, in, in the last decade, speaking from 2020. Um, and uh, there's also, I think, special role for public universities in that they need to hang on to their mission to uh, represent the public good, uh, because they are under so much pressure from private interests to serve uh, narrow corporate interests uh, in the way that research questions are framed in, what's in terms of what sort of research gets uh, large-scale funding that uh, you know, public universities really do have to hang on tenaciously to that public, uh, public good role. So I think in, in, in Europe you do have the benefit of uh, you know, s traditions of higher participation rates at least in the last 50 years, uh, but I'll let Lars pick that thread up. I, I think the, the big difference between Europe and Australia is that Europe is, uh, is mixed up of very different cultures that are founded in nations, and those nations react differently. So in Europe, uh, where, where probably Australia would, would act like one country would do in, in Europe, uh, have a discussion, have a debate, use your, your system, take a decision. Then in Europe, that would be done in 27 countries in parallel, and after that we would have the fight about who is right among those. So, so, the, so the thing would be discussed on another level with different national approaches to things. And just, just think of nuclear energy in, in Europe where France is totally dependent on their nuclear energy. Denmark decided in, in the 80s not to have nuclear energy. So we have so, and, and Sweden has for a long, long time had nuclear energy, but also has decided to phase it out for, for 15 years or something like that. So we have, we have real intense discussion inside Europe of these different positions. And I think that makes it difficult because decisions have already been taken and cultures are, are, are different. But there's also a big chance in that, which is that we get it uh, discussed uh, much more in depth. I think John, that's, that's a good thing. Thank you. John, as a communications expert, what would your advice to the Prime Minister be in this, in this scenario? Everything's unravelling, everything's out of control, everyone's up in arms. Can you, where did it start unravelling? How can you re-ravel it? Uh, but what would your advice be to the, the Prime Minister to try and contain the situation? Well, I go back to the last point. I think it needs uh, that big time out and reflection about what the true value proposition is for the various stakeholders and then just play that out. Of course, you've created a higher hurdle to get across by having stumbled 
So that's the challenge. On that question of uh, who determines public good, clearly it is uh, a matter of public policy has to be determined by a democratic process. And one of the things we struggle with as an institution called CSIRO is our role as an advisor to inform policy and to make sure we never cross to advocacy. Because once you've crossed that line, you can't be a trusted advisor if you've taken a position. And I think that's one of the challenges of science is that in that mode of providing advice, you have to stick to the facts and others will interpret it and form their own opinion on how those facts should be used. And that can be tough because guess what? Scientists are individuals too with political views. And stakeholders. And stakeholders, yeah. Uh, yeah. Gary Humphreys, there's so many complicated factors at play in this scenario, but does it boil down to something as simple as salesmanship? Uh, that whether you can sell sell the story better is that where this broke down? It wasn't sold the right way. It was uh, uh, too much hype, uh, not enough delivery, or is it a lot more complicated than that? I think salesmanship's a big part of it. Uh, you know, no doubt when when you see you know thousands of jobs created, big opportunities, you know the the media opportunity sort of flash in your eyes as a politician, and you sort of rush forward to sort of endorse a proposal that might have those benefits, and when the drawbacks become clearer and suddenly you've got to sort of work out how to subtly shift your position so that you're not caught by the, the changing tide. Um, look, um, uh, I would hope in a situation like this, if, if uh, you were the government, you would um, you would sort of, if you had the luxury of a little bit of time, you'd withdraw, you'd, you'd put an idea on hold and you'd then commission um, some kind of review or, uh, or study and hopefully you'd by that process be able to elevate the the value of good, solid scientific advice. Sometimes governments, you know, seek reviews which are essentially political in nature. Sometimes they do turn to, you know, the, the, a search for truth through, through what's empirically provable as the best policy or the best approach. And let's hope on a situation like this, you could use the latter process rather than the former one to make the right decision. Michelle, how would you see this playing out? Um, well, I'd, I'd be thinking that um, I'm not sure that an inquiry would be very helpful, but I would be thinking um, that um, we, we need to engage um, perhaps the institutions that we wouldn't immediately think of. Um, um, I think of the you know, adult learning network which sits outside of uh, the, uh, the formal institutions of universities and TAFEs, which, which is a huge grassroots of people who gather to learn a whole range of things that sit outside. Of the, um, of the education system and how we can garner processes where people can learn about these, these situations and this, this, this opportunity so that they can engage equally um, in, these, in these sorts of scenarios. Um, and that that forms part of the evidence base that's then used. When we talk about, you know, we have the evidence, um, often we're talking about a particular type of evidence and we have hierarchies of evidence. And the very best evidence-based practice, in my view, takes in what the scientists say, but it also takes in the experiences and needs of the people that are actually most intimately involved or who have perhaps been engaged in similar or like situations. Because often the knowledge that's generated them from that fast out, um, you know, outstrips some of the knowledge that has to be, is painstakingly developed through that scientific process. So I'd actually be, uh, be giving the advice of turning to uh, the citizenry and, and using some of the processes that Adult Learning Australia has used through its, its learning circles that it had many years ago around the use of water, around democratic citizenry, to, to try and establish a grassroots process that engages people in debating the science but also the, the social impacts and getting a more rounded understanding of what, what we really mean by evidence that we need in order to be able to make a truly uh, democratic and public decision because the public is all of us and the public after all is the people who put the politicians in their place. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It also means what do we mean when we say evidence-based? I mean, do we mean the scientific evidence? Or do we mean evidence like we have it in a courthouse, where we call in different people and let they, them speak about the issue? I, I, I think if, if, we, if we put some meaning in it like in the courthouse, then I, I begin to support the idea of evidence-based policymaking. But if we, if we think the scientists are the only ones who can make 
relevant evidence, uh, then, then I think we go wrong. And maybe we should stop using that word evidence-based because it's very easily misunderstood. I think we should uh, may use the word knowledge-based instead, which for me is much, much broader. Uh, we're about to have to wrap it up. Andrew, can I just ask you for some, some final thoughts? Uh, is this sort of scenario from a, a historic, uh, historical point of view totally uh, out of the box, or uh, is this the sort of process that we have seen in Australia uh, play out in, in many different scenarios, uh, and is it something that we're likely to continue seeing in the future? Which end are you looking at this? Oh, sorry, <laughs> Andrew <laughs> Bunnell, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I think the, uh, the, the size of the numbers uh, uh, is, is, is probably different, but these are, you know, generic issues that we've been discussing. Uh, I mean, for me, one of the exciting things about the idea of uh, this project is that uh, it would rep represent major public investment in pure research, and by 2020, universities have been pushed to do almost entirely applied research, and that, uh, you know, the University of, uh, of, of Queensland in 2012 had... Uh, had uh, five uh, large research institutes which uh, were partly cross-subsidised by the teaching faculties which are taxed to help set them up, uh, including the humanities faculty, and uh, their research is very closely aligned with big corporate stakeholders in mining, pharmaceuticals and biotech, so, so bizarrely underfunded humanities departments are sort of, uh, to some extent, cross-subsidising the uh, R&D costs of... Uh, of uh, you know these these sectors uh, through publicly subsidised overheads, uh, and given that we've got historically tradition of very low in uh, private uh, business investment in R and D in Australia compared with the rest of the OECD, we've been uh, consistently below average for decades. I think uh, universities are having to make up the slack. So the idea of a big spend on pure research is is that I think would actually be uh, breaking new ground. <laughs> well, on that note, we will have to leave it there. Unfortunately, uh, many questions uh, unanswered or yet to be asked, uh, and no opportunity for me to, to weave into the 2020 hypothetical, uh, the, the, uh, the election of a, a new Labor Prime Minister after seven years in the wilderness, uh, Prime Minister Lee, uh, <laughs> who's just been elected on a, on a platform of holding an inquiry into high-speed rail and perhaps considering... Uh, a second Sydney airport and getting around to building an MBN uh, and S Liberal Senate leader uh, Gary Humphreys having to uh, deal with the fallout of the Cory Bernardi uh, new animal husband react. <laughs> but on that note, sadly we won't get to any of that, I can, <laughs> sadly. Uh, thank you to all our panellists for their time uh, and more significantly I suppose for their very interesting uh, observations and thoughts. Uh, thank you uh, all for your uh, attendance and attention. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>